Revelation chapter 19, we're going to talk about Christ's return as the conquering Lord. I will admit at the end of our last message, uh, it's, it's, it was pretty much a downer, chapter 18. Um, we're seeing the judgment of God being poured out on the earth. But now in Revelation 19, we begin with praise in heaven. Praise for the judgment of spiritual and commercial Babylon. Praise for the conquering king, Jesus, who will come back, who will return and make everything right. And so my uh, intention today is to encourage you and to uplift you and let you know that even though there are difficult times ahead for this old world, because this world will indeed be judged. And yet those who belong to Christ, those who surrender their hearts and lives to the Lord, those who are truly born again Christians, they will be on the winning side. And in the end, Jesus will take care of it all. Well, now we're going to follow our pattern and I will read in the King James chapter 19 and you read along with me. Revelation 19, 1. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia. And her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen. Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of almighty, uh, of mighty thunderings, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, 
with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshiped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Heavenly Father, thank you for this glorious and triumphant scene. It is yet before us, but Lord, we know it is sure to come. And we say, come quickly, Lord Jesus, amen. Well, there's praise in heaven for judgment. How often have you heard that? Usually like it's like, oh no, judgment, judgment. Well, there is praise for judgment. This section, this chapter is really the climax of chapter 18. Babylon's friends mourned her fall, but God's people celebrated the fall of the false Babylon. Now the word hallelujah, it's interesting. It's mentioned four times here. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. That's the only place it's written in the New Testament is right here. Now the word hallelujah is an imperative word. In other words, it's telling you to do something. To do it. To do what? Well, it means to give praise to God. Now, some see people seem to be afraid of using the word hallelujah. You don't hear it very often. I think I used to hear it more in church. But it's a good word. We'll all be saying it in heaven. But we shouldn't use it flippantly. The word hallelujah is a word of praise, unique praise to God. Now, the focus of worship is on the great works of God specifically, his works in righteous judgment. And the voice from the throne saying, praise our God, all you his servants. Might be Jesus saying that. Could be from one of the angels who attend the throne of God. But the call is to praise God. And why? Well, you know why? Because the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. The height of praise on earth is only a dim shadow of what is described in these verses. The Lamb, Jesus Christ, is going to marry his wife, the church, and the wedding is finally taking place. The righteousness of the saints is their faith in Christ. And the marriage of the Lamb, who is the Messiah, has come. And that is reason for great praise. Now, in the New Testament, the church is presented as the fiancé of Jesus, awaiting the day of marriage. In the Bible, Bible times... A marriage involved two major events, the betrothal period and then the wedding itself. These are normally separated in the Bible by a period of time during which the two individuals were considered husband and wife uh, as far as their obligations and their faithfulness, but they have not come together yet. The wedding uh, was after the, the betrothal period. Now, this is an analogy. This is a parable for the church. We are espoused to Christ by faith, but we have not yet experienced the wedding of the the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we're looking forward to that day. We are looking forward to the day when our heavenly groom will come forth from heaven for his bride and return to heaven with his bride for the marriage feast that will last throughout eternity. Now the idea of marriage is a very powerful symbol, isn't it? Among God's pictures of our relationship to him, he is our creator, we are his creature. He's our shepherd, we're his sheep. He's our master, we're his slave. He's our father, we're his children. But oh, he is our husband and we are his wife. 
Now, how do you get yourself ready for the wedding of the lamb? How do you get yourself ready? Well, how does a wife get ready for her wedding? Make sure she's nice and clean. <laughs> she gets her dress ready, her flowers ready, her hair ready. A lot of women will go get their nails done and their toenails done and they want everything done. They want to be ready. But how do we make ourselves ready for Christ? Well, like any bride needs help. Somebody do my hair. Somebody take care of my fingernails. Somebody make my dress for me. Very few brides do it all themselves. And you need somebody to be watching you from the outside so they can tell whether you're ready or not. You know, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. He cleans us up. He makes sure that we're pure. He works in us a loyal and faithful character uh, that will be fit for the new Jerusalem. Believers are created and divinely prepared for good works. We're not saved by works, but we're saved unto good works. It's kind of like our hope chest for our marriage to Christ. Now I am noting here that Jesus himself anticipates eagerly this marriage supper. In Matthew 26, 29, you remember he, he spoke of the day when he would drink of the fruit of the, wine, of, of the vine again uh, in the kingdom. The thought is of a banquet or a party. It's the marriage supper of the lamb. This is a joyous occasion and Jesus is looking forward to it. Do you think he's looking forward to it more than we are? I think he probably is, which ought to make us ashamed of ourselves. Because he longs for us. He loves us. Wow, the anticipation that he has for this great marriage ceremony ought to make us wake up and say, Oh, Lord, uh, prepare me for this. Help me to understand. Now in verse 10, you'll notice that John falls down at the feet of somebody to worship him. He was overwhelmed by what he was seeing and by what the angel was revealing to him. So he began to worship the angel who immediately stopped him. And he exalted, the angel exalted Christ. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That means all prophecy has to do with Jesus. He is the heart of the soul. Uh, uh, of the gospel, of the scriptures. But I guess my question is, why would such a godly man as John make such a blunder as this? I don't know. No created being is to be worshiped. Um, he says, I'm your fellow servant. There are some important distinctions between humans and angels, but they're both the servants of the same Lord. He was, had the spirit of prophecy, bearing witness to Jesus. Any teaching of prophecy that takes our minds and hearts away from Jesus is not being properly communicated. Some people think that prophecy just means telling the future accurately. Well, it could involve that, but you know what the spirit of prophecy is? It's all about Jesus. And now verse 11, we see this glorious scene, magnificent scene. Heaven opens up and here comes Jesus on a white horse, not on a little donkey, not with palm branches waving where they're saying, Hosanna. No, he is coming seated on a white horse as a conqueror and he's called faithful and true and he has come to make war. He has a vesture dipped in blood and his name is the word of God. This is Jesus. He's the king of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus is coming as judge and as a general to make war, war. I don't think the world thinks of Jesus in this way. I don't think the church thinks of him in that way. They think of him 
as a shepherd, you know, sitting out in the field, holding the, but boy, you picture him on a white horse with a sword bringing judgment, but that's who he is. Can I tell you today that any view of God that eliminates his role as judge and general is a misrepresentation of Christ. Remember, the book of Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ and who he is. This Jesus riding on his horse, coming down out of the sky, I got news for you. He's not gentle Jesus, meek and mild. He is a conquering king. And you know what? That Jesus you can't control. You can't put him on the shelf and say, I'll see you next Sunday. Nah, he's coming. He's coming in the sky. And he demands our attention, but he also demands our submission to his will. You know, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You want to know something? It's all about which end of the gun you're on. <laughs> which end of the gun you're on? Now, in the Bible sense, they had swords. Which end of the, the sword are you on? Are you behind Jesus coming with him? Or are you in front of him? The object of his judgment. Now notice that he wore many crowns. There was a time when he wore a crown of thorns, but not anymore. Now he wears many crowns. Crowns of royalty and authority. The fact that there are many crowns means that Jesus is the ultimate royal authority and power. He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The name is on his thigh for prominence. He's riding on a horseback. And yet, no one knows the name except himself. That is, no one can really comprehend it perfectly. His robe is sprinkled in blood, whether it's his blood reminding us of the cross or it's the blood of his enemies. That's a, that's a big debate there. But <clears throat> both scenarios are possible. The armies in heaven are God's people. But the angels will undoubtedly be present also. Five times in Revelation, John emphasizes that Jesus' sword comes out of his mouth. Now, this is a dramatic way of referring to the power of his word. Jesus conquers by the power of his word. Remember when they were going to take him in the Garden of Gethsemane? And he just turned toward them and said, I'm, I'm, I'm the one you're looking for. When he said that, they fell down. It was by his word that is sharper than any two-edged sword that he comes to rule and reign in triumph, to rule the nations with a rod of iron, as predicted in Psalm 2. And now in verse 17, we see an angel inviting all these birds to come for dinner. Boy, this is kind of an unpleasant uh, picture, isn't it? The repetition of flesh five times in verse 18 is revealing. Look, look, read it. That you meet the flesh of the kings, the flesh of the captains, the flesh of the mighty men, the flesh of the horses, and then that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. Wow, flesh, flesh, flesh. These are those who have been walking in the flesh. And now their flesh is going to be consumed. The day of God's patience is over. The day of God's patience is over and Jesus comes to rule and reign forever and ever and ever. There are four different suppers described in the Bible. The Supper of Salvation, alluded to in Jesus' parable of Luke chapter 14. The Lord's Supper, that's a commemoration of Christ's sacrifice. 
The marriage supper of the lamb, that's the third one. You know what the fourth one is? This supper here of the flesh of the ungodly. If you reject the first supper, the supper of salvation, the second will mean nothing to you. The supper of a commemoration of Christ's sacrifice. And you'll not be present at the third, which is the supper of the lamb. But there's a fourth supper. And everyone gets to go to at least one of these suppers. Some will eat at the suppers they go to, but I have news for you. Some will be eaten at the supper they go to. That's kind of... I don't, I, I don't know, I guess I don't want to use the word scary uh, picture here. But it, it, it's an awesome picture of God's judgment. In verse 19, And I saw the beasts of the kings of the earth, and the armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the throne. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet. And they're just cast into the lake of fire, burning, brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse. This is the battle of Armageddon. This is the war. The armies are gathered together against Christ. And this is the end of sin. Isn't sin? It's kind of insane, you know. You're going to lose. Jesus is going to win. Jesus doesn't want to bring judgment on people. Do you know? It's while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. He came to die on the cross so that you wouldn't have to go to that second supper or that last supper. He came to save your soul. He doesn't want it. God, God's not willing that any should perish. But there is a time when because in their fury they come to do battle with Christ, that they will be defeated completely. I think we should probably never underestimate man's folly in sin and his hatred for God. Why do they hate God? I don't know. I really don't. It doesn't make sense to me. Man is constantly at war with God now. He wants to rebel against God, but can you imagine God sent his only begotten son, Jesus, sent him to this earth, and do you know what wicked man did? Killed him. Hung him on a cross. Oh, the shame of it. You know, John doesn't talk much about the battle, does he? the Battle of Armageddon. You know why? Because it's a completely one-sided affair. It's just a simple act of war. The Battle of Armageddon is like God laughing at the climax of God, uh, man's arrogance. It's not a difficult battle for him. Now, the beast and the false prophet receive some special treatment. They're cast alive into the lake of fire before the great white throne judgment uh, holds court in Revelation chapter 20. <clears throat> the lake of fire is what we normally consider hell. It's real. And there's nothing more important than avoiding this place. And so... We're done with the beast and his mark and his image and his false prophet. We're done with him. And it didn't take long for Jesus to clean it all up, did it? Can't stop at chapter 18. We have to go on to chapter 19. And now when we get to chapters 21 and 22... A glorious new scene. We have two chapters still to go. You can say, boy, we could stop right here because we see that Christ is, uh, oh, I'm sorry, 20, 21, and 22. 
and three more chapters. We could stop right here and we could just uh, be happy because we see that Jesus has defeated uh, his enemies. But no, there's still a little bit more work to do. And uh, we're going to read about that in the future. Okay, now let me read that chapter in the Living Bible. Revelation chapter 19. After this, I heard the shouting of a vast crowd in heaven. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Salvation is from our God. Honor and authority belong to him alone, for his judgments are just and true. He has punished the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her sin, and he has avenged the murder of his servants. Again and again, the voices rang, praise the Lord. The smoke from her burning ascends forever and forever. Then the four and twenty elders and the four living beings fell down and worshiped God who was sitting upon the throne and said, amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And out of the throne came a voice that said, praise our God, all you his servants, small and great who fear him. Then I heard again what sounded like the shouting of a huge crowd or like the waves of a hundred oceans crashing on the shore or like the mighty rolling of great thunder. Praise the Lord, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and honor him, for the time has come for the wedding banquet of the Lamb, and his bride has prepared herself. She is permitted to wear the cleanest and whitest and finest of linens. Fine linen represents the good deeds done by the people of God. And the angel dictated this sentence to me, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. And he added, God himself has stated this. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said, no, don't, for I'm a servant of God, just as you are, and as your brother Christians are, who testify of their faith in Jesus. The purpose of all prophecy and of all I have shown you is to tell you about Jesus. Then I saw heaven open and a white horse standing there. And the one sitting on the horse was named Faithful and True the one who justly punishes and makes war. His eyes were like flames and on his head were many crowns. A name was written on his forehead and only he knew its meaning. He was clothed with garments dipped in blood and his title was the word of God. The armies of heaven dressed in finest linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. In his mouth, he held a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He ruled them with an iron grip and he trod the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And on his robe and thigh was written this title, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sunshine shouting loudly to the birds, come gather together for the supper of the great God. Come and eat the flesh of kings and captains and great generals and horses and riders and of all humanity, both great and small, slave and free. Then I saw the evil creature gathering the governments of the earth and their armies to fight against the one sitting on the horse and his army. And the evil creature was captured and with him the false prophet who could do mighty miracles when the evil creature was present. Miracles that deceived all who had accepted the evil creature's mark and who worshiped his statue, both of them, that evil creature and his false prophet were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And their entire army was killed with the sharp sword of the mouth of the one riding the white horse. And all the birds of heaven were gorged with their flesh. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It is a word of triumphant victory. And we thank you, Lord, and we say, come quickly, Lord Jesus, make all things right and help us, Lord, as your bride to be prepared in all ways for your coming. We do anticipate your coming and we say, Lord Jesus, come quickly. We pray it in your name. Amen. Amen.